um, clear your throat. I record yep. this as well. I hope that's okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Not a problem. Hey, Brad, how are you doing? Hey, good afternoon. Good. How cool is it that I can be sitting here in Sydney at my computer and you're in Singapore? Yeah, it's, um, it's pretty good. Uh, technology has gotten us this way because with this pandemic, it would be a bit difficult to do a lot of things otherwise. So you stay in contact with your family via video link? Yeah, um, it's great at the moment, especially just having a newborn baby. It's mm. two months old. Two and oh, a half months David old. now. But, uh, what is it, 11 weeks on Wednesday. Wow. Yeah, it's growing up. He's been here for a while. <laughs> yeah. Time that was flies. like the world's best kept secret. Um, yeah, it was it was difficult for me. Um, but we decided between us that I guess the people that like really needed to know, like our parents and, and that knew. Um, but I guess we just wanted to keep it between us and and I guess you can you can always have a lot of people throwing opinions and what they think and probably times like that you don't really need it so yeah why would anyone have the right to have an opinion well every, everyone everyone does and really can, yeah that's a shame to hear that because it should be a really good time in your life and and I'm sure it was yeah. um and um you've got a beautiful little boy like it doesn't get much better than that you've got a beautiful partner and yeah. And the world's looking good. And um, ha tell me, how are you enjoying Singapore? Um, it's been challenging. Um, I mean, we love being here. Um, but obviously, like everyone else, you know, you can't can't go anywhere now for the last um, what, 18 months. Um, we haven't been, been allowed out of the country. Um, I mean, it is it's safe, it's secure. Um, and I guess, you know, we've got, a, we've got each other. <laughs> um, my wife's got a sister here and, and we've got friends. So, um, yeah, I mean, if, if we couldn't contact family back home and that sort of thing, it would be a lot harder, but, um, staying in contact, I think has, has been good. Um, yeah. And, and where's your, where's your family based? The majority of your family so um mum and dad are now up in tukley oh really that's up my old neck of the woods yeah so i grew up in penrith um spent 21 years in penrith basically um and then so about three four years ago mum and dad well actually about five years ago they bought a house in tukley and rented it out for a couple of years and then they decided to move up there they live uh, in one of the avenues yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. Everyone that lives in Tickley lives in an avenue. It's like yeah. First Avenue, Second Avenue, Third Avenue. I used to live in Seventh Avenue years ago. We'll talk about that one later then. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? And yeah. um, so, so they've moved, they've taken on the sea change and moved from Penrith to Tickley and Yeah, they're loving it up there. Um they're both retired now. Dad retired about about a month ago. Okay. Um, fully retired anyway. Like he he was doing some part time teaching. He's a oh he's in IT. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, that's um, exciting. So, what made you get into cooking? What is it that um, that that drew you into this industry? Well, um, I've always been good with my hands. Um, so if it wasn't cooking, it would have been like electrical or mechanic, something like that. Now, when I was, uh, end of year 10, I started looking for apprenticeships in, in electrical work. Um, I applied for a few apprenticeships. I did testing for some, never heard anything back and just, I, I was, I was a bit, um, a bit saddened by it all, I guess, like, you apply for all these things and do all these, yeah, do like appoint um, interviews and, and 
uh, because for electrical, you have to be good with maths um, and that side of things. So I had to do a lot of testing and stuff as well. But just uh, back then, there was like one job, you would have two or 300 um, interviewees, um, let alone how, I don't know how many applicants they would have. But so I went back to school to do year 11. And um, one of the subjects I'd applied to do was metallurgy. Um, was what? Metallurgy. So like the study of metals and, and their makeup. Oh, okay. And, and that sort of thing. So it was one of the one of the subjects that was available. And I thought that sounds cool. Um, but it was being offered at another school and no one I knew was going to take the subject as well. And so I sort of thought about it and went, mm, two or three of my mates were doing hospitality and it was being run at the same school I was at. I was like, yeah, I like food. Surely that's gonna be pretty easy. And then, so I, I changed subjects. It wasn't as easy as I thought it would be. I was gonna but... say, and, and what would you say now to that younger, um, you know, younger Brad today? <laughs> I mean, I, I wouldn't change anything I've done um, with, with where it's taken me and what I've done. Um, I've put in a lot of hard work to um, be better, uh, to better myself all the time, I guess. Um, but I guess at that point, I worked out that I was actually good at it. Um, and I'd always, always had an interest. Like I was always sitting at the table, helping mum cook dinner and that sort of thing. Um, and, and so it was like near the end of year 11, we had to do um, a work placement um for hospitality so i went up and i did my two weeks at the hydro majestic in medlow bath and they offered me a job um after the two weeks but it was like i was i was waking up at i don't know two or three o'clock in the morning to get up to medlow bath by train um and then by the time i was getting home was probably six seven o'clock at night yeah, it's a long day. And I was just like, so I turned them down, but it sort of put in me like, what am I doing? Mm. And, and so one of my teachers at school sort of said, look, you know, there's a few of you that probably need to think about what you're doing at school and why you're here. And that's, that's sort of got the ball rolling. <laughs> and I said to my parents, I think, you know, school's not for me. I need, I need, to, need to start looking at doing something else. And so so where, did you, so where did you do your apprenticeship at? I started at the Bourbon in King's Cross. Oh, okay, yeah. Bit so of a famous straight, old um, hangout spot. Yeah, I was, I was straight in there after they'd done the renovations. Um, I wasn't there long. <laughs> um, the group I was hired by at the time basically hired about 15 or 20 apprentices across the group just before Christmas. Right, okay. That was very much a, a signature move back in the day, wasn't it? Yeah. So I, I, with the same group, I moved over to the Commodore at North Sydney. Okay. So I was there for another couple of months and then they basically went around and started chopping apprentices. Um, and so, I mean, uh, after that, I was, I was basically told by the owner of this group, you know, you're worthless, you're crap, you're... You, you're never going to be a good chef. Why are you even bothering? That sort of thing. So to me, that gave me a bit of drive. And I was, oh, good. I basically went, you know what? No, you, you're not going to tell me that. I'm, I'm going to, you know, put in the effort, put in the hard work. And and one day I'll, I'll show you, you know. So after that, uh, I went to the Fiddler, Mean Fiddler, before they'd done the renovations. So I was out there for a while. Um, Were you out there with Martin Webster Williams? Doesn't sound familiar. No. Uh, okay. Uh, who, was Michael chef, who was the chef when you were at the Fiddler? The first time was Michael Acevedo, uh, and Adam Bain was the Sue. Scratching my head now. <laughs> no, that's okay. It was just such a a dynamic business, you know, out the back of you know we well it's kind of like Windsor Rouse Hill right and yeah um and and it's just a beautiful beautiful um hotel 
Yeah, I mean, we were, we were packing numbers out there every every Friday, Saturday night, Sunday lunch. We, were, you know, I can't remember how many we were doing when we when I was first out there. It was nowhere near the, like the second time I was out there. Uh, so I left between being there the first time and the second time. I'd gone to a cafe, um, the Barn Cafe in Roselle, which is no longer there. Um, was Tracy my, there when you were at the Barn Cafe? Tracy. The owner, was it? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's, all, um, that's a long time it, ago. Well, the, the guy was the son of the owner of Aristocrat Gaming. Mm. All I remember, really. But I followed Michael from from the uh, the Fiddler. He, he was then out there. And then after that, I went to the um, Glenbrook Bowling Club, which was owned by Panthers. I was out there for about another six months and then one of the one of my mates was still at the fiddler and they'd finished the renovations and he was like hey why don't you come back so i went i went back there um so how then, did you get into parliament how did you end up at Can how did you end up going to canberra because what i've loved about looking at your career is is that you've gone from from level to next level to next level like you've really evolved yeah. um, throughout your career and you can see that so I was at a cafe in Penrith um, and then um, I'd hit 21 and I decided that I wanted to go and work on a cruise ship because I had to wait till I was 21. You can't, you can't work on a cruise ship until you're 21. Um, so I went, I actually went and did this for three days. <laughs> <laughs> it just wasn't a good idea. <laughs> it wasn't for me. Um, I went on as a demi chef um and i i went on with the expectation that i was going to learn so much um and that you know like the pay wasn't that great but if i if i can go on here for a year or six months or whatever it was and just learn a heap then you know i'll either keep doing it and jump up the ranks or whatever but i went on there one day got handed a handed like a stack like this of different menus but no one actually told me how they related to anything um there was a chef to party there so i was under him for one day and then they basically said yeah you're on your own this is on a ship yeah so the the exec chef really didn't do anything in the kitchen the exec sous and the sous were nowhere to ever be seen and i i really wondered how the how the ship runs um so i said to the after the second night i think it was i, I said to the executive chef look I, I don't want to waste your time i don't don't want to waste mine um we were going to be stuck in dry dock for two or three months in brisbane and so i just said look i'm going to get off tomorrow and he was he was fine about it but so then after that <laughs> i ended up in in Siebel, um met a girl there and She'd gotten a job down in Canberra, so. So that's where you her. went. Yeah. And did you enjoy um, your time while you were in Canberra? I know that you were in the Golden Chef's Hat. Um, you and a team buddy. You were doing that for three years, I think it was. Yeah. So, um, so after I got the job in Parliament, um, that was with uh, Steve Forrester to begin with. Um, he basically pushed me and Morgan. He was a first year apprentice at the time. Um, basically, said you guys are doing Nestle because he was he was the state president at the time, and there wasn't enough numbers in in the competition. So it was like, and it was like two days time or something, or the, or the next day. I can't remember. Like it was very really? short notice. Yeah, and he basically he's like, look, you know, this afternoon we're going to practice, try and come up with a few ideas, and tomorrow or whatever it was, you know you're going to have to go and try and do something. I'd done a few competitions before doing Nestle, so had had a fairly good idea as to, you know, how to do competitions, but I'd never done it with someone else. Um, but it was, I mean, it was a great experience. We we won that first year in, in Canberra, went to Sydney for, um, the, for the national competition and, um, Shane and Cameron won that year. 
I think Shane and Cameron won the next year, or <laughs> whatever, it, however that worked. But um, yeah, so then the second year we got we got a silver in Canberra. Um, we didn't go th through to nationals that year, and then the third year um, we won Canberra and went through to nationals in Sydney again. Um, That's pretty exciting. So did you enjoy your time while you're at Parliament? And I'm really sorry if you can hear the background noise of a lawnmower. It's okay, the joys of working from home. <laughs> um, yeah, Parliament was was awesome. Um, I mean, I cooked for some pretty, um, how do you say, high-ranking or <laughs> celebrities, whatnot, um, Barack Obama, Queen Elizabeth, uh, to name a few, as well as obviously Australian. Um, do you run out? Do you do you get to get their signature? Like, do you get to get them to sign a book or something? Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're you're a bit further back than uh, than that. Um, especially, I mean, when Obama was there, it was it was pretty secure. Um, so, do they actually have people taste their food before they actually let him eat it? No, so. Like the way we did it there, he, he brought a chef with him um, and the chef watched us plate. So we plated uh, like the main table. So the head table once 10, I think it was there. And then he just picked one plate and then that's that's the plate for, for the president and they would watch that plate go out. Wow. Was, so basically, I mean, if someone was gonna poison them, you'd have to poison the whole table. <laughs> Fair enough. Kind of give it away, wouldn't it? But you never yeah. know. It was just always something I always wondered about. So did you then go to Bahrain? Yeah, so um, so I'd been at Parliament for about three and a half years and um, I was looking for, for an, a next step, I guess. Um, and um, I'd just been promoted uh, probably six months earlier to senior chef of the party. Um, and I guess I wasn't too happy with what I was being paid or, you know, I, I was just getting a bit bored. Um, and so, I mean, I, I always keep my eye on job advertisements, see what's out there, what's going on, what people are, you know, advertising that they're paying and that sort of thing. And so I, one, one night, um, about two o'clock in the morning, I threw in a threw in my CV to a, an advertisement, and it was like, "Cook for the rock stars, cook for the celebrities, this and that." And they didn't say who it was, where it was, really. You know, but oh yeah, throw one in here, see what happens. Next morning, eight o'clock in the morning, I had a had a uh, recruiter call me up from Brisbane, um, and then so out of that, he he basically said, "Oh, do you mind if I pass your information on to?" the executive chef, I think he's what you're looking for. Um, so then about a week later, I had a phone call from the executive chef in Bahrain, um, had a had a, about an hour phone call with him. And then, yeah, he offered me the job. Um, so last week we had Paul Brown on and as a guest and he was also chefing in Bahrain and he was um, a chef to the king. Yeah. And you were different. You were the chef to the queen. I was one one of yeah. Um, so obviously they've they've all got their different palaces. Um, so the one I was in was the ladies' palace. So it had like the queen and and the daughters and the wives um, that, and the kids. Um, so yeah, I was. Um, there was about seven Australians at the time in the in the wow. management. And the executive chef, the, the head pastry chef, the executive Suze. And then, um, yeah, I was the chef de cuisine there along with um, another Australian. Did you love it? Did you love that experience? Um, it, it was, yeah, it was something different, that's for sure. And um, it's, it's not something that I have ever seen again, I guess, um, in, the, in the opulence and um as paul was saying like they they show their wealth through food so like the spoon should never touch the bottom of a dish so you know if if they're if they're taking rice or they're taking whatever you know food 
um, the, the spoon should never touch the bottom because that would mean there's not enough. Wow. Um, but yeah, like we did some, some epic dinners. Um, we had like all the heads of state from the Middle East um, come and they built houses on the King's property um, for them all and their entourage. And then we did a, we did a dinner for, I think it was 16 people. Um, and it was quite expensive. <laughs> and you don't uh, have to worry about food costs. Like you're able to have some fun with some really unique ingredients. Yeah, um, there's like, we were never worried about food costs. We were never told to, you know, something had to be a specific um, cost or anything like that. It was whatever they want they get. Um, but at the same time, trying to find some ingredients and and the freshness of some ingredients wasn't always um, that great. Um, but since me being there, like they've, um, they've started doing a lot of greenhouse um, okay. growing. Like there's a lot of uninhabitable spaces, like we, we would call it the middle, middle of the desert sort of thing. But there's areas that are just like open, uh, you know, between cliff faces and that sort of thing was just sand or, you know, and um, so now they've decided to do, you know, greenhouses and um, hydroponic tomatoes and lettuces and all these sorts of things where previously it was all flown in from either France or Holland. Um, and like we, we would fly in our own um, stuff from time to time as well. Um, just like we would also fly back. Um, we had our own lamb farm. Um, so the queen, if the queen was going to South of France, for example, we might take a couple of lamb with us. So how was it going, because this was your first time out of Australia, right? Like you'd never gone out of Australia before. Yeah, no, I, um, I mean, there was there was one stamp in my passport and that was from going into international waters um, on, on the cruise ship. On your three-day trip. <laughs> yeah, apart from so, that. I, so how yeah. was it going from sort of like Parliament House, you know, where you're part of a brigade and you're chefing, to then just going off some little island off of Saudi Arabia. I mean, how does that even happen? Did you have to like um, pick yourself? Yeah, some days it was a bit that way. Um, but I guess having like having that team of other Australians with you, you could really like bounce stuff off them. And there was other people there that you know you're all in the same same camp same boat so to speak but um i mean yeah we went i went from really being in a comfort zone of, of thinking that um I, I really knew what i was doing well I, like that's what i thought when i was at uh parliament um especially being there for you know three and a half years you settle in you know everyone um and then going into something completely new um with, with a lot of cuisine that I'd never seen before, um, even some ingredients that I'd never seen before. Um, it was, yeah, it was, some days were quite difficult. Um, and do, and they, I, do they allow women in the kitchens there? Like a, a women's, are women allowed to be chefs? Uh, yeah, so we had, we had one whole kitchen that was just Moroccan ladies. Um, so they looked after Moroccan cuisine. Then we had another one that was just uh, Arabic ladies, or sorry, Bahraini ladies. Um, and they looked after like Bahraini sweets and stuff like that. But all the other kitchens were, were just men. Um, so we had about uh, 70 um, across. Uh, so we had a European kitchen, which we pretty well worked out of. Uh, we had a Arabic kitchen. We had a um, old kitchen. We had a pastry kitchen. Uh, did you get to work in all of them? Like, did you used to, did you get to work around and learn so different, a, different pieces off everybody? Yeah, as a chef de cuisine, um, we basically managed the whole operation um, to to some degree, like the day to day operation, uh, as well as doing specific dishes for like the shaker. Or the shakes um 
And so we, we would have to go to the other kitchens to make sure that everything was to standard. Um, we, 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 we had to know what the dishes were and what they should taste like and look like because when we're sending them out to, we, we would send out to other palaces. Um, so it was sort of like a central kitchen almost. Um, we yeah. were sending about 16 buffets, lunch and dinner. Um, so to the King, Crown Prince, um, the, the sons, their palaces. Um, so we always had to know what things were meant to be. Um, there was a lot that I wouldn't know how to cook necessarily, um, but I know what they were meant to taste like, what they were meant to look like. Um, because we, we had to check before something would go out, we would have to make sure that that was to standard. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's pretty amazing. So let's just fast forward a little bit and we're going to start to talk about Singapore. So mm -hmm. I know that you've worked at the ICC and Delaware North and you, you were working with Stuart Webb there. And like, as I said, like your career has kind of really evolved, but I'm really kind of interested to hear about Singapore and your time since you've been there and, and what it is that you love about Singapore um, and and what kind of took you there in the first place? Yeah, I mean, um, I guess... Because it can't like, be the heat. It is so hot in Singapore. It's not that hot. It is <laughs> so hot. I was there, honestly. I had to stay underground the entire time. I went outside and just about shriveled up like a prune. <laughs> yeah, you work, you work out how to get around it. Um, how but, do you get around? Like, seriously, how do you get around that? Work, working in the Middle East, like working in Bahrain. Oh, and true. Around. Like Iraq, like uh, it was 48 degrees some days in Iraq. Um, Bahrain was same, like 40s um, a lot of the time. Um, and then Sydney, Sydney, like I grew up in Penrith and some summers it's 45 plus out there. Um, I know, but Singapore just is like never ending. I, I don't know how a hormonal woman could survive in Singapore. Honestly, she'd almost have to self combust. <laughs> It's, it's only, it's like 32, 33 degrees every day. Um, but some days are more humid than others. And that's what. I think really, it's a humidity. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think it's a humidity. Sweat. Although um, having said that, I do love, love, love Singapore. I, I have to say it's probably one of my favorite places. It's so clean and organized. Yeah. And like people walk on one side. They don't just walk all over the place. And it's. Oh, hmm. <laughs> oh has that's it changed one, a little that's bit? That's one that annoys me. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, you know you go into the hawkers um you know places and you've just got like so much food to choose from i you know i put up the big, um big, the big, big hotel in the picture here and you know everything there is just so well designed i think yeah we went to mbs uh my wife was about six months pregnant at the time it was like our baby baby moon um went there for three nights as a lovely hotel but during uh covid restrictions you know you're only allowed you're one hour in the pool each day um and that's and, got the infinity pool at it hasn't it yeah yeah so i i chose my timings each each day to try and get some of you know the morning some of the afternoon some of the night in there um because I, I i like doing photography as well so okay uh, trying to get some different shots from up there and um but yeah i mean like singapore it's great food um people are lovely um but it's it's safe it's secure um i always imagined that i would go somewhere else so after after coming back from iraq um i met my wife like within two months or three months of coming back from iraq and uh wasn't actually looking to settle down with someone at the time. I, I thought, you know, like I would end up somewhere else. And, um, but she, she always thought that she would end up somewhere else as well. So I guess between us, we, we knew we'd probably not be in Australia um, the whole time. And then, so yeah, she, she ended up getting offered a job over here and, and I followed over and um, I've had, yeah, a couple of jobs since being over here and um it's been, it's been great so far we've, that's we've what have had to have been like the ultimate i mean i think one 
to work with Rick, Rick Stevens would have been like, I would imagine incredible. Um, to work yeah. in that that size volume would have just been. Had you seen that size volume before? No, nothing that, like that. That scale of operation. It's it's something else. Um, I mean, yeah, like Rick Rick's awesome. Um, I didn't work directly under Rick for. I know, for but even much. just the fact that you could like touch him or look at him and know that he's there <laughs> would be just like for me to be like, oh yes, there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so we had some good conversations um over the time but yeah um i mean i think i was i was in icc2 um so they have two catering centers um or well, one of them's been shut down um for the last year or so um due to covid because they've gone from between the two centers we were doing about 100 and 110,000 meals a day um down to less than 2,000 meals a day. That's incredible. That is incredible. Um, and when I was talking to Rick last time, uh, COVID, when we had the last lockdown with COVID and mm. Singapore was in a, a bit of a, a situation as well, he was saying that, um, that they'd started to feed, was it the university students? So, so when I was there, uh, we were doing the dormitories. So yeah. it's, uh, migrant workers, so like Nepalese, um, Indian, mainland Chinese, um, and there's a few other nationalities in there as well, but they do a lot of the lower paid um, work around Singapore. Singapore wouldn't exist if it wasn't for these people. Yeah. Uh, I love you. I love hearing you say that. It, it, I mean, anyone that thinks other was, I don't know what they're thinking, but um so there was there was a large outbreak of COVID in in a couple of the dormitories, and so they basically locked locked them all down, um, tested everyone, and then started splitting them into different places. So the like the the national stadium was one of the places where they were quarantining people till they got well and they could go back into their dormitories. Um, but the dormitories are not a very high level of or high standard of living. Um, and that's come under fire um, through that period as well. And so the way people were eating and what they were eating was not nutritious or um, in a good way to keep them from uh, spreading COVID, I guess. Oh, okay. so, were they like coming together as groups? Yeah, and like just eating with their hands and there wasn't sanitary mm -hmm. conditions. Um, that they were congregating, you know, a lot of people in one one room, that sort of thing. Um, so the government actually, uh, I guess, put out tenders to different um, caterers, um, us, like at Sats, and then uh, Dinata is the other um, airline caterer. So they had some, and then there was a few other hotels and things like that that were doing some of it as well. Um, so we were doing... I think we were doing about 60,000 meals at our, at our peak for these dormitories, um, starting from breakfast. I think I was starting at two o'clock in the morning, um, get breakfast out. Um, it was very different to what all the staff knew in SATs because um, airline catering is, is cook chill. Um, you plate everything up cold or dish everything into... Um, uh, aluminium foil trays and stuff like that. Everything goes out cold normally. Uh, whereas these meals, obviously, when you when you're doing twenty thousand meals a sitting, they have to go out hot because no one can heat them up on site. Um, so we, we were doing like normal banquet catering, basically. You know, plating everything or dishing everything hot into takeaway containers or little bento little bento boxes, that sort of thing um putting label you know everything had to be labeled everything had to be put lids on and then um sent out in trucks to the to the different dormitories so, I mean, yeah. mass, it was just massive i think it was like if if i was to rattle off 16 football fields would have been the mass would that be pretty close to the, the size people. of the operation oh the operation um well i don't even know how to put it into like 
catering wise on each um, center it was about 400 chefs I think it was something like that um, we had each each center had about 25 40 tray rationales what did you expect it'd be just like something quite amazing to see it in operation. And I think that it'd be exciting to see when when they get the airlines back up and running, you know, to yeah. capacity and to be able to see that once again and see what might have changed during that time as I think, well. I think there'll be a lot of changes. Um, I know, like, there was a few airlines looking at changing their hot food to a frozen, basically a frozen meal that they heat up on board. Um, whereas all the, all the food was being sent chilled um, mm -hmm. when I was there. But I know that obviously everyone's always looking to, you know, cut a bit yeah, out right. here, here or there, yeah. Um, so I know that's probably something that a, a few airlines will look at um, and then they just keep their, their business class and their first class will be kept to a, to a higher standard. Um, I mean, it was when it, when we were doing fifty to fifty five thousand meals a day, it was an operation. It was, you know, everything had to move like clockwork. Everything had to be out at the specific time, because you have to have it cold chilled for a minimum. I think it was eight hours uh, prior to takeoff, um, and yeah, it was. I had uh, had about eighty in my kitchen. Wow. Um, that's exec sue for cold kitchen. We had nine exec sues in, in our center. Um, and then, yeah. So when it comes to Singapore, I actually get a little bit intimidated when I'm in Singapore because um, I just, I, I don't know their culture well enough. And we went out for dinner one night and it was a lazy Susan in the middle of the table and it was at a pretty fine sort of restaurant. Mm -hmm. And um, we had barbecue duck and the barbecue duck was on the table. Yep. But they kind of have a sequence in how they, they serve the barbecue duck. I mean, I just thought that you would just slice it and put it into a pancake shallot, hoist in and down it goes. But there's actually a process, isn't there? Um, so I've never done the whole duck over here, um, but usually what my wife would do um, is she would say like, okay, so we'll have the we'll have duck pancake, for example, but then out of the other parts of the duck, we'll have two other dishes. Um, but I haven't done that in a long time, but yeah, that's... I don't know how they did it with with, with uh, you. It was but... pretty special, and I was I was I was a bit like, oh dear, I, I think I've kind of um, my Australia came out in me, and I felt like a bit of a bogan. But when it comes to um, the the community and the expats that are in Singapore, do you guys all hang out, and have you created like a bit of a bond with other Australians? Not so much for me. Um, I mean, I. My, most of my friends are, are locals, actually. Um, I, I guess, like, now with what I do, like, I'm working with a lot of British. <laughs> um, Say that again, it just cut so, out. Sorry, are you working with a lot of what? A lot of British. Oh, okay. Um, so my, my current job, I'm working for the British High Commissioner um, at her residence. Um so I was wondering what Eden Hall was. So that's the um, the British High Commissioner. Yeah. So so her residence um, is separate to the actual High Commission, um, and so I have a have a small little commercial kitchen out the back of their house, um, if that's what you would call it. <laughs> um, it's a it's a lovely property, um, but we also have space to do. Um, functions and events inside the house. Um, but I only do her official official events and business. So I don't do like her daily meals, like breakfast, lunch and dinner, that sort of thing. Um, is that because she doesn't really want that or is that because um, no, like you just can't work that many hours in a day? Well, that, that would probably be one part of it, but um, my role is paid for by the UK citizens, I guess. Okay. 
taxpayer pays for my role. Um, and in saying that, so then everything that I, I prepare, all the food is paid for. Well, if it's, if it's one of her official business functions and that sort of thing is paid for by the UK taxpayer. So they have to be very careful uh, with the money that they spend um, being a government role and everything has to have clear um has to be quite transparent yeah transparent that's what i was looking for um because you know we get audited why why did you buy this why did you do that that sort of thing um, oh really that would be a bit yeah, of a um culture shock coming out of bahrain <laughs> you would be like oh really it's, it's, it's very different. Um, I mean, I I had an understanding when I when I took the role um, that it would be uh, there would be a budget. Um, I didn't quite understand that it would be as strict or tight as what it is. Yeah. Um, but um, I mean, I make it work. Um, I think there's probably others that if they'd taken this role that they might struggle. Um, but you've got to be creative with with your money with what and, you've got. and what you've got, yeah. Um, so, I mean, sorry, yeah, been, go on. Been there about six months now. Um, and so I've sort of worked out how to play with the funds a bit. And, you know, if you sometimes you might not spend all your money, but you do spend all your money because you know that you won't get it again. I was going to say, you don't want to end up with a surplus, right? Because I'll take it off you. So it's 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 per event or dinner or lunch or whatever. So if they say it's forty dollars a head, and there's six people, you're you're only going to get that forty dollars. Yeah. Um, and so if you if you spend, let's say, one hundred and fifty, the rest of it, you won't you won't see it again. So. So what happens if you go over budget? Does that do you have to pay for it? I haven't yet. Uh, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have to pay it. Um, but you don't uh, want to ever be in that situation. I would, I would need to be able to justify why, um, and and I guess I wouldn't go over. Um, you know, if there, if there wasn't a, a reason, um, I'd you know try my best to stay within it. So tell me, how's COVID affected Singapore? What's been going on? And um, you guys. My understanding was that you're in a lockdown right now, but you said that you're not actually in like a lockdown lockdown. No, How has COVID affected Singapore and the and the hospitality industry in, in particular? Yeah. Um, well, I guess since the start, like, I mean, there's all, well, not all, but a lot of the expat chefs have gone home. Okay. Um, a lot of restaurants, a lot of, businesses within hospitality had to make major cuts. Um, we went we went into a, a full lockdown for, I think it was six weeks last year near, near the beginning, um, which, I mean, I, I worked the whole way through because I was at SATS um, and I was feeding people um, in the dormitories, but there was a lot of people that had no work. A lot of restaurants that were that were closed for a lot, large majority of that time. Um, I guess the ones that could pivoted and you know started doing delivery or takeaway um, that sort of thing. Um, but now, can I ask a little question there? Because registrations in Singapore are a lot different to here in Australia when it comes to cars and and utilities. Mm. How do the how do you, do you have deli like how do they work out the delivery drivers and um, does Uber exist in Singapore? What, what do you mean as far as how do they work out the delivery? So you drivers? know how um, here when a when a business pivoted they we could have however many drivers we want on the roads it, did, it just doesn't matter in hmm. Singapore there's a cap right like on cars and registrations and um, yeah. So most most company, most businesses don't do their own delivery uh, because it's yeah it's just ridiculously expensive to have your own vehicles. Mm. Uh, you're looking like for a motorbike, probably minimum twenty to thirty thousand for a motorbike, or 
you know, a, a, um, scooter. But, but for what? For to buy it outright? Yeah, yeah. If you if you if you wanted to buy them and have them as your own delivery vehicles, but what they what they have is called Grab. Is is one of them. So you got Grab. You've got Deliveroo. You've got um, Food Panda. Um, they they used to have Uber, but um, Grab. I think Grab bought out Uber. In, okay. Asia. But, and do they have like pretty high delivery charges on the um, deliveries? It depends on what it is. Depends on you know the day, the time of day, all sorts of things. They they do different promotions. Um, they generally they start around three dollars fifty or something like that. Um, oh, same. It's not same same really. The, the, yeah, yeah the, I mean the price, the prices on the delivery platforms are usually a lot more expensive than um, going to a restaurant or something like that. Um, but I think a lot of, a lot of people during those first six months of COVID really started just cooking more at home. Those that could, mm. um, uh, we like for us, we, we would get a, um, a food delivery. Like we would get, um, our meat delivered from a butcher, uh, like frozen. Um, I bought a freezer actually at that time. So I'd fill so the You didn't have a freezer before that. Uh, just to, you know, like the small one on top of your fridge. That's yeah, sort of, yeah. That wasn't going to be enough. Um, like, because I had to make it worthwhile buying in bulk um, because the a lot of the businesses that, that you were buying deliveries through was a minimum four-week wait. Really? Why? Yeah. Well, they were all so um, busy now, like, because everyone was buying their groceries online. Everyone was buying meat through these online butchers. Everyone, like everything went online pretty much. And so, you know, you used to be able to get two or three days ahead. You could, you could order and get, you know, your meat delivered or whatever groceries. But during that time, they went to about yeah, four weeks or six weeks. Um, so I would order six weeks ahead but i would order enough for probably a month uh and then yeah, well, do you have cooking, to do a lot of cooking from home um but then like sats i i only made it through till um what J july last year um and then I, I was on an employment pass at the time and they basically they got rid of everyone that was on a, an, an employment pass um so you were just waiting, waiting for your time, basically, till they would say, I'm sorry, but you don't have a job. So what happens as an expat? Um, are you entitled to any kind of government um, support? Nothing. Nothing at all? No. They, they, they were supporting some people a little bit, um, like locals and that sort of thing, um, through COVID with some grants. Um, some of the businesses were getting some grants and that to, to try and help them along, but... As, a, as an expat, there's nothing. Um, so yeah, I, I went from pretty well July. Um, I, got, I got paid out what I was mm. due um, as part of my contract. Um, but there was Malaysians that got cut very early on. There was uh, probably almost 50% of the workforce was Malaysians that were coming in every day. They would, they would drive or ride in um, across the causeway every day. So they, they got cut first. And the, there was, we had mainland Chinese workers as well. They got cut. Um, and then it was basically, if you, if you weren't a PR, a permanent resident or a, or a Singaporean, um, then yeah, they basically got rid of every, everyone that wasn't Singaporean or PR. So if you weren't able to get home and you were obviously still in Singapore, how did people survive? Like, did you, did businesses create like a hospo for hospo or a support hospitality? Like, how did these people survive? Well, there's only, I, I haven't heard of much at all um, as far as support for, for people. Um, I know of one, um, Emmanuel Bernardos um, is another Australian. It's yes. A, uh, I know many, yeah. Yeah, um, at Swissitel. Uh, so they were doing like uh, discounts for hospitality workers in one of their restaurants. Um, but I haven't really heard of much much else um, over here. 
like I know obviously in Australia they had like job keeper or job seeker and you weren't entitled to that either. Well, I, I, I can't claim any benefits in Australia because I'm not haven't been a taxpayer in Australia for yeah. the last couple of years. Um, so yeah, I mean for me, like I went six months without a job. Um and Singapore's Western. not a cheap place to live, is it? No. Um, I mean, like, yeah, we, we can survive, but it's, I mean, fiddling your fingers for, for six months as well, you know, and you apply for jobs and don't hear anything. Um, and then they, they've set it up so that they, they've, got a, they've got a government, um, like, job advertising site, I guess, um, and as, as an expat, you can't even apply for the jobs on there without being a PR or a, or a Singaporean. Really? So the government... Is that because in Singapore they'll look after their own first and then the, the expats yeah. afterwards? So, so what was happening was the government was paying about 65 or 70% of a local salary if they were a new hire. Right, So during, okay. during that period... They, they were paying up to a certain amount and they would they would pay, you know, for you to hire a Singaporean or a PR. Um, and at the time, like, I didn't have PR. Now I've got PR, so... Um, have you? Yeah, we got we got our permanent residency in June, um, a couple weeks before my son was born. And so, I mean, that gives me a lot more um, stability, I guess. Um, because was that hard all, to get? Was that really? Was that a hard process? Generally, it's extremely hard. Um, for us, it took six months of waiting. But my wife is obviously Chinese. She's Malaysian-born Chinese, but she's on an Australian passport. She spent about 17, 18 years in Australia. Um, what we had going for us was the fact that we were having a baby boy. Okay. So every man in Singapore does national service. Oh. As a second tier permanent resident, he will have to do national service. If, I mean, there's, there's rules around it, obviously, as to when and if you uh, give away the permanent residency. But okay. if we were still here um, at that time, he, he would have to do that. So that's that's one thing that you know you can have going for you, I guess, um, when you're applying for PR. I didn't realise that. So every permanent resident in Singapore, a male, has to has to do some um, service. Yeah. So I mean, I have to register for it, um, but because of the scheme that we got PR under um, and my age, um, I, I won't have to. Well, as far as I'm aware. <laughs> I won't have to. Um, if if I was in my twenties, mate, early twenties, I may have to. Um, but yeah, they obviously, if you if you're Singaporean or you're um, a second tier, so you're the son of a um, permanent resident, then yeah, you have to have to do it. That's so amazing. Too, I had no too. idea. So, because. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I've always been uh, under the under the. I've always thought that with Singapore, that Singaporeans like to eat out all the time. Like they're not people that generally cook a lot at home. Is that true or false? I'd generally say, speaking, I'd, I'd and say don't count now pre-COVID. Yeah, yeah, I'd say generally speaking, for a lot, um, they they would eat out more than cooking at home. So some some condos and some HDVs and that they barely have kitchen. Well, that's what I was going to say. Like I thought that because they're you know that um, that whole unit living that a lot of them um, when I was over there and I was talking to people because I like to ask a lot of questions. Yeah. Had actually said that they didn't have kitchens and I'm like, how can you not have a kitchen? So they would have been um, I don't know their life would have changed quite significantly. Yeah, um, I guess. Like the hawker, the hawker markets, the hawker centres, um, a lot of the time you have still been open. Um, okay. But you're not allowed to eat in them. 
So a lot of people would get take like go down, pick up their meal and get takeaway. Yeah. Because it's it's the cheapest option. It's three dollars fifty for chicken rice. It's you know, you can you can get a fairly decent meal for under five dollars. Yeah, okay. Um and that's pretty well every every hawker center. Um like I live on the basically in the C B D and we've got two hawker centers within 10 minute walk and, and they're all similarly priced. Um, they then, so with, with the current restrictions, I guess um, some people were only eating in, um, in hawker centers because they, they can't go to restaurants. Um, so if you're not vaccinated and that's having both shots and two weeks following um, your your last vaccination, you can't eat out in restaurants. Right. Okay. And how do they regulate that? Like, how do they mandate that? Yeah. So we've got we've got an app um, that, that well, this is the second app that they've used, but it's called Trace Together. Um, I don't know if you can see it there. Oh yes. Um, and then that basically has this thing and it says like COVID health status and it says vaccinated that that won't show up as vaccinated until you're two weeks past your second shot okay. so you have to show that um like we went and stayed in the Hilton um on Saturday night um, that must have been really tough I saw your photos yeah well they so our apartment cuts the electricity off uh once a year overnight and so um having a baby we didn't really want to stay at home with no air conditioning no fans oh, no, no. no i could think of nothing worse yeah so you might as well so, go and stay at the hilton right it's a pretty pretty good second option you know to be honest it was the cheapest five star really? in singapore well if you haven't got a lot of inbound traffic at the moment what are the hotel prices like are they quite reasonable it was 200 and something for the night That's including breakfast good. yeah so their breakfast now, obviously, they we can't do buffets. Oh so, yeah, um, it's like a a la carte style. Um, you you scan a QR code and up comes the menu on your phone, and you and they'll come and take your order. But you, I mean, like I had a poached eggs on toast with sausages and tomato and bacon and uh, coffee. And are you sitting actually in the restaurant, or are you, and it's all social distanced, or you got to eat in your room? No, um, so you've got the option. You can, you can take you can take like a pre-packed bento and go back to your room, or we we decided to go and sit down in the restaurant. Um, but yeah, the tables are two meters apart or something, um, and yeah, you you still have to show there obviously that you you're vaccinated. Um, I guess if you're not vac, oh actually I don't even think you can stay in the hotel if you're not vaccinated. We had to show at. Um, check in that we were vaccinated so what because they're you know singaporeans and and people in singapore they they tend to be rule followers right so yeah. you know they, they're not sort of people that um that go against the and, the, and they'll call system. they'll call you out if you're not following the rules okay like if if someone if someone's not wearing a mask or whatever like people say you know where's your mask or did did you forget your mask like that, sometimes they'll be generally nice about it, like give you the benefit of the doubt. Like, did you did you forget your mask? Yeah. And some sometimes I mean people do. Yeah. I've, I've walked out of my apartment, walking down the street, and I'm like, oh no, where's my mask? And then I have to try and get back into the apartment, and they're like, where's your mask? I'm like, well, I live here, and it's in my in my apartment. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. So long so as you're you not. Say, sorry. Sorry. As long as you're not like arrogantly rude about it, if it's a genuine mistake, people are pretty easy going about it. Um, but obviously, if you're on the MRT not wearing a mask, you'll, you'll cop a fine pretty quickly. What are the fines like? I think it's five hundred. Oh, okay. First, like first offence or whatever. Um, but I mean, like there's there's a lady now in jail for sixteen weeks um because she refused to wear a mask wow it was down oh, well. they don't muck around over there i mean you throw a bit of rubbish or you can't even eat gum i mean 
Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be walking around without a mask on. But um, can you believe it's four o'clock? I, I, I oh, yeah. love this. I've loved this conversation. But um, in closing, Singapore and Australia were, or they were working towards having the travel bubble in place, and very much looking forward to that. And it'll be great when that does happen. And until then, stay safe, stay well, yeah. and and Thanks. enjoy your time with your little baby. Yeah. And your wife as well, obviously. <laughs> And yeah. it's good to see you so happy. It's really lovely to see you happy. Well, I guess you, you've got to stay um, stay positive and in good spirits. Otherwise, it's not going to be much fun. <laughs> um, I mean, you... it'd be nice nice once we can bring the baby back and show the grandparents, but I'm not holding that. Until breath. then it's Zoom calls or FaceTime. Yeah, exactly. We look forward to seeing you when you come back. I'm actually booked to go to Singapore in june next year so actually it's late may yep. um so hopefully it'll all be opened up and and Should all happening be. by then yeah yeah but it is it's really lovely to see you and it's been really lovely to talk to you and i think that to be able to look at the career that you've had and where you've been and what you've done um is a true testament to the person that you are it's incredible really incredible thanks vanessa and i think you'd be a great mentor to young people just quietly yeah, um, I mean it's yeah something that I that I definitely look at um, in the future. I, don't, I mean, uh, what what I'm doing at the moment, um, uh, I don't know how long I'll I'll continue doing it. Um, I I really loved like being at Sats um, with with some younger guys and that sort of thing. Um, having a brigade that I could um, you know teach or even just give them some of my knowledge um it was great um which is I'm, I'm really missing being by mm -hmm. myself where i currently am but yeah well it's... listen we're always here we're always um available for a chat and until then stay well stay safe and look forward to talking to you soon you too and thanks Thank for you. doing today it was so good yeah, yeah. bye thanks. bye